Hello and welcome to this tutorial on choosing a hydrophone. Selecting the optimum measurement device often requires finding a compromise between a number of constraints, some of which can be mutually contradictory. The first thing we need to consider is our pressure level. How much acoustic signal have we got? This is often accompanied by a spatial constraint. For example, at the focal plane of a focus transducer, we can often have very large signal levels, but as we move off axis, these can fall in amplitude substantially. Pressure level and spatial constraints can often be affected by the frequency range that we're trying to measure as well. As a for example, if we have a very high frequency and therefore short wavelength source, there may be a very narrow field in which we can find that maximum pressure, whereas lower frequency devices, this is often a broader constraint with wider beam widths. The environment and noise in which we're trying to make measurements is also important. And this is often accompanied by signal duration. Specifically, if we've got a large electromagnetic interference arising from our source transducer, with a long signal, it can be difficult to separate acoustic and electromagnetic interference. It's only once we've considered all of these aspects together that we can home in on our final hydrophone selection. As mentioned, this is a compromise, and this particular tutorial is an overview of some of the things we need to consider. There's much more detail on hydrophone sensitivity and frequency response in another of our tutorials. And the same can be said for hydrophone directivity and spatial averaging. Also during the course of this video, I'll discuss needle hydrophones, membrane hydrophones, and fiber optic hydrophones, all of which have got separate tutorial videos associated with those. The first thing we need to consider is dynamic range. Ultrasonic measurements can often be conducted anywhere between tens of pascals and tens of megapascals, although rarely that entire range within one measurement. This is in excess of 120 dB dynamic range. If we compare this with the typical hydrophone measurement system, which has a dynamic range of approximately 70 dB, we know that we then need to optimize whereabouts our hydrophone's dynamic range sits within the measurement range that might be possible. The key factor here is sensitivity. Let's look at some examples. If we have a hydrophone sensitivity that is too low for the signal that we're trying to measure, we'll be noise limited. Conversely, if we have too much sensitivity, then we run the risk of clipping the input stage of any preamplifier associated with our hydrophone measurement. The optimum solution is to find something that's well matched between the range of measurement and the hydrophone dynamic range. And in this signal, we can see we've captured all of the features of the waveform nicely and we're not noise limited. So what factors affect sensitivity of a hydrophone? Well, piezoelectric material have got different sensitivities, the way that the device is constructed, and also the preamplification that may be involved in the hydrophone system. However, most of these are rarely user selectable. So in terms of what's available to the user, we've got limited options. The constructional type may have an influence on sensitivity, specifically for probe type hydrophones, where there's a pressure reflection from a rigid boundary, this can cause pressure doubling. So all things being equal, a same size hydrophone that's a needle hydrophone can often be expected to have twice the output of a comparable membrane. But most importantly is area. The reason for this is that the voltage signal that's output from a hydrophone is the spatial integral of the pressure received across the area surface. But size really does matter when it comes to hydrophones, because the area constraint, as we've seen, can affect sensitivity, but it can also affect directivity, spatial averaging, and frequency response. Let's now look at directivity and how that's affected by sensor size. 
This is a typical directivity graph for a hydrophone at a range of different frequencies. We can see here that as we go up and up in frequency, the directional pattern becomes ever more directional. This is because the hydrophone is becoming large as a function of wavelength. In fact, most directionality functions take the form as shown in the equation here. We note that k is wave number and thus the reciprocal of wavelength. a is the radius of the hydrophone. So when we find we've got a large ka number, so in other words we have something that is large versus wavelength, we get a more directional response. Now let's consider the impact of sensor size and spatial averaging. Consider a source of ultrasound that's radiating forward. If we scan in front of that radiating source, we get a measured profile for the apparent beam width. If we undertake the same measurement with a very much smaller sensor, we find we get a very different profile. In fact, by using a sensor that's too large, we find that we've got a reduced amplitude and an increased beam width relative to a very much smaller sensor. Before we can go on to see exactly how area affects frequency response, we need to look a little at how diffraction is affecting the frequency response of probe type hydrophones. And here we're talking about needle and optical fiber hydrophones. Consider a radial cross-section of the pressure field around the tip of a needle hydrophone, where we have an axis of rotational symmetry on the left-hand edge. You'll notice that there is a circularly radiating pressure signal in the upper right-hand quadrant, and this arises from diffraction at the very corner of the needle hydrophone. We can see a similar effect on the probe-type hydrophones. Now, as this diffracted wave expands outwards, there will be an interference pattern caused as the signals from the left and the right hand edges of the hydrophone start to interfere. These interferences give rise to radial diffracted resonances, which can often be seen on typical responses for needle hydrophones, as shown on the graph. Notice here where the peak of the radial resonance is. Now this is what we typically expect to see for a larger area needle hydrophone. If we move to a smaller area needle hydrophone, the shape remains the same, but expands along the frequency axis. And we also notice that the peak in the response has moved upwards. Whilst we're talking about frequency response, it's probably important to consider how that should be compared with the bandwidth of the signals we're looking to measure. Consider the graph here, which shows in blue the time signature and in red the spectral representation of a typical diagnostic ultrasound waveform. Were we to try and measure that with an optical fibre hydrophone, whose response is shown in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that there is substantial variation over the 40 meg bandwidth. Now we can see this is a very broadband source from the red trace, and therefore were we to try and measure this very broadband source with a signal that's got substantial variation in, we may get quite a lot of distortion introduced on the shape of the waveform. We could correct for this with the deconvolution operation, but it's one other thing to correct for. Were we to look at a needle hydrophone, this has got less variation, but you can still see that in the range from about 3 to 10 megahertz, which is where we can see from the spectral signal, there's a lot of energy in the signal, there's still quite a lot of variation. In fact, if we'd like our hydrophone output voltage to be a very good representation of the pressure field, having something with a very smooth response as a function of frequency, such as the membrane hydrophone shown here, would be a really good choice. However, we may be looking at a much more narrow band signal, as we often find with therapeutic ultrasound devices. As shown here, you can see you've got a much longer time duration signal, but the bandwidth is very, very limited indeed. 
In this case, were we to measure the response with a fibre optic or with a needle hydrophone, although these have got variations as a function of frequency, within the bandwidth of the source, this variation is minimal and we would get a very good representation of our underpinning time domain function. Let's also look at how electromagnetic interference and signal duration pay an effect. We can see here this signal is actually a combination of various aspects. We have a section where we've got a purely electromagnetic signal, and this is given away by the fact that the propagation delay to get to the receiving sensor is virtually zero. There's then a section in the middle which appears to have a large flat envelope, but is actually derived from the combination of an acoustic signal and electromagnetic interference. And then once the EM signal has died away, what we are left with is solely is the acoustic signal. Now, this is not uncommon when making measurements with piezoelectric hydrophones, but ideally we'd like to have a sensor which is immune to the electromagnetic interference originating from the source transducer. So here, a fiber optic hydrophone, which has got an optical transduction method, can be very appealing. The environment in which we're making measurements is also important. With a lot of therapeutic fields, there's a risk of thermal damage and of mechanical cavitation damage. In this case, an expensive sensor placed within those fields could very easily become destroyed. And this is one of the other advantages of optical fiber hydrophones, where the sensors themselves are relatively cheap. We can then replace them if they do become damaged under these extreme conditions. In fact, we've talked about cheapness in passing there, but it's important to consider budget budgetary considerations as well. A membrane hydrophone, as we've mentioned, is a gold standard measuring device and is often reflected in its price point. Fiber optic sensors themselves are very cheap by, compared to other hydrophone types, but the optics needed to drive them can be somewhat more expensive. So one has to balance between what the consumption of sensors is likely to be relative to the cost of the optics needed to drive it. Quite often, needle hydrophones provide the best balance between capability and cost. For these reasons, as listed already, we often find that diagnostic ultrasound uses membrane hydrophones to record its signals. General purpose measurements from a range of different transducers often use needle hydrophones. And physio and HIFU devices are often characterized with optical fiber hydrophones. But these are common choices, it's not exhaustive. And as we've seen already, the compromises that we need to make in order to optimize our particular choice depend on many different aspects. So to summarize then, hydrophone selection is always a compromise. The first thing we need to consider is sensitivity. Everything else is a secondary concern and we need to look at these secondary factors carefully and strike a balance between them. We hope you found this tutorial interesting. If you have, please come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial video series.